Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. So all the words and phrases that you heard in that video are contained in this book called Ephesians. Really, it's a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to some people that he knew. He spent a couple years together with them. And they're living in a place where it's become difficult to be a follower of Jesus. They are, spiritually speaking, in the minority. And there's some pushback. And life is difficult and hard for them. And we can get confused in moments like that. Am I missing something? And God, uh, you know, what is going on around here? Because it seems like it got a little bit harder following you than it was even before. Four. And so the Apostle Paul writes this letter. He cares about these people. And how does he begin that letter to people going through hard times? And we might find it a little bit curious because he talks about identity, who you are in Jesus. Why would he start that way? Because it is a solid foundation that regardless of what's happening around you, this is who you are in Jesus. This is how God sees you. And then he talked about, and Pastor Matt talked about this last week, how do we get there? How do we get in Jesus? Well, we were dead spiritually, and Jesus makes us alive. It's by grace, not of works, so that nobody can boast. We become spiritually alive to God through God's work and God's power. And now, Paul is going to begin to turn the corner and to say, now, in light of who you are, and in light of how you got there, here are some of the implications of what it means to follow after Jesus. Here's how to apply it to your daily life. And let me start in the direction we're going today, which is talking about the power of unity with a true story. This story comes from a podcast called Truth Over Tribe. And he talks about, it's a pastor who's sharing this story, and he talks about a family reunion, a family of his. And they got together, and this was shortly before the last election. And so there's probably 40 people-ish, and they put the food down, and everybody's greeting everybody. They haven't seen some of the people for a long time, and everything is all set to go. And in light of the upcoming presidential election, somebody on the progressive side of the aisle decides to make her progressive political views known. Well, in response to that, somebody on the conservative side of the aisle, who's had some adult beverages, <laughs> feels the need to, you know, debate that and push back a little bit. And before you know it, there's a full-fledged and temperature-rising debate that's going on. He says, after several minutes, actually, literally, the food is flying. <laughs> and people are throwing, like, potato salad at each other. And it ends with an awkward sort of silence as people pack up all their things and go their separate ways. And maybe, once upon a time, it would have ended there, and maybe a year later, people would have said, oh, remember, you know, when this happened and somebody lost their, yeah, that was kind of funny, and, you know, we're kind of over that. But... Social media has added a whole new element. And so on the other side of that family reunion, people began to post things about the other side. One of the members on one side of the aisle, doesn't matter, um, died at one point in that next year, suddenly a brain cancer, leaving a couple of little kids. The other side didn't come to the funeral. After that, the other side took back some wedding and graduation invitations. And years later, there's still animosity and resentment and hardship. And oh, by the way, most of the people who were throwing food and posting things, following after Jesus. So what are we to do with that, especially in a day where it is very easy to be polarized from each other? article in um, The Economist, American states are now petri dishes of polarization. And it seems like the extremes are where 
We have to choose, and anything in between is not sufficient for people on the extreme. This article talks about ways in which we do that. This one's been around for a long time, right? Republicans and Democrats, but they say it goes far beyond that now. You've got liberal versus conservative. You've got the 1% versus the 99%. You've got white versus black, and you've got climate skeptics versus climate believers and you've got business versus environment, and you've got country music versus actual music. <laughs> it's just getting too heavy, okay? So I may have thrown that one in there myself. We're on a roll, let's throw one more in there. NFL football versus Las Vegas Raiders football. I don't know what they're doing, but it's not NFL football. But there are a lot of ways in which our day, my guess is you know about all of this already without hearing about that article. I think we know this. We live at a time where increasingly it is a world of us versus them, of different ideas, different places, different cultures, different ethnicities, and it's a challenge. Pew Research, by the way, is a uh, one research group, and they studied the 19 most developed countries in the world to see which one was the most divided. And guess what? We're number one <laughs> of being divided. Northwestern University did a study on it. Here's part of their conclusion. It's no longer that people only associate with their own side. It's that they're contemptuous of the other side. This rise in hate is what we find so alarming. People on the other side are not just wrong, they're evil. And not just people on the other side, people on our side who are not sufficiently pure are apostates. You're not far enough on the polar extreme. So you can't be one of us. And I don't know about you, but in my lifetime, it feels like that is more reality than it's ever been. And so what are we to do? Well, in this New Testament letter called Ephesians, it helps us to understand this is not the first time and not the first culture that has been in this place where all these differences provide the opportunity for there to be conflict and building walls that separate us from each other. And the city to which this letter is written, the church in that city, was one of those places. It was like a melting pot of its day. And all kinds of different people are finding home there and finding even faith in Jesus there but then still allowing the opportunity for some of those differences to make their way into how the community related to each other. And so the times of change and the cultures are a little bit different, but can I just give you, here's the list of what it was like in the Roman society to which Paul is writing this letter. So you had Romans versus non-Romans. A citizen had a higher status and more opportunities um, than a non-Roman. Men versus women. For the most part, women were treated more like property than somebody who had the same value um, as a man. Citizens versus non-citizens. Again, political standing there and social standing had implications. Greeks versus barbarians. Greeks said there's two people in the world, Greeks and everybody else is a barbarian. So welcome to all the barbarians here this morning. Um, we have free versus slave and people in the um, Roman Empire, you could have free status. You could also sell yourself into a slave status and that was something you could even voluntarily do and it assured that you would have food on the table, but you lost a whole bunch of rights that way. There was rich versus poor and it's a result of a lot of these other things and then there was Jew versus Gentile. And again, that sums up every nationality. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And so in the city of Ephesus, there was a perfect opportunity for all of these divisions. You realize we're not talking about our behavior, our morality, right? These are things that we bring with us in light of where we were born and maybe the way that we've carried out our life. We're waiting about morality. That's still coming in his letter in a little while. But he's talking about all these potentials for division and building walls from one another. And they were perfectly unified in a place called Ephesus. And what Paul does there is kind of a unique thing. And it's recorded for us in the book of Acts. 
He shows up in the city of Ephesus, one of the major Roman cities in the Eastern Empire, and it is that melting pot there. And he does first what he had done in so many other locations. He goes to one of the Jewish synagogues and he talks about Jesus, about his life and about his death and about his resurrection. And you know what happens to him? He gets kicked out of the synagogue. That happened to Paul on a number of occasions. So what is a guy to do when he gets kicked out of that? Well, there are a lot of different opportunities around there. There are some pagan locations. He could go into a private home, maybe be a Jewish home, maybe be a Gentile home. He doesn't do any of those things. Unique and brilliant. You know what he does? He rents out a place called the Hall of Tyrannus. It's a lecture hall. And in essence, maybe we might say, it's neutral ground for everybody. Because nobody really has one of those connections in one way or another in those lists that we were talking about. And there, people of all different stripes and backgrounds and kinds show up and they hear about Jesus. And a number of them put their faith in Jesus and become followers of Jesus. What kind of people are there? People from both sides of this list. But now it's years later and Paul hears that there's some divisions and there's some walls that are being built between some of these differences that people have. And he's going to communicate to them that there is an identity that transcends all of this. And we don't stop being who we are, but there is something in this kind of community that has the power and has the potential to unify into one. Do you think what Paul is going to say about overcoming these kind of differences has any relevance to the day in which we live, in the culture in which we live right now? A whole lot. So how is it that we move beyond an us versus them mindset? That's where Paul goes as he turns the corner in his letter to say, now let's apply some of what it means to be in Jesus and know how we got there purely by the grace and the power of God. What does that mean? So therefore, in light of identity and God's power, remember that you at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. What in the world is he talking about there? So let's slow down just for a minute. So he's talking about Gentiles, and there are also Jewish people. Remember, that's one of the divides. Jewish people had what we call the Old Testament, and there were the laws of God. Part of the sign of a covenant with God was this practice called circumcision. And here you see that they were called the uncircumcision. That's talking about the Gentiles. Over time, this was actually used as an ethnic slur to say, you are not one of us. And so it was used as a way to talk about somebody who was lesser than Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ. And so what was happening is that even people who had been given a gift by God of a way of identifying connection with God had elevated and moralized that gift and now were using it to view themselves as more superior and to view others as inferior. And that is a case study from one moment in time in that place, but I think that principle applies over the span of time and can be used in many different ways. That what is a gift is not viewed as a gift and not recognized as an opportunity to be thankful. Instead, it is moralized and elevated so that somebody can feel superior and view us somebody else as inferior. But once you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. He's recognizing, hey, look, some people had the laws of God and some people were way far off, spiritually speaking. And that had the potential and now was creating the opportunity to build some walls. So what does Paul do first? He helps us to know that we got to admit the problem that there is an issue, that there's a reality in the human heart, that instead of building bridges, we can build walls. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises that God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. So he's just saying, look, this is the reality. 
This is what it, you know, actually is from day to day, and it begins with an admission of the promise. But a gift had been used and elevated to make one group superior and another group inferior. And then he goes on, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near. How? By the blood of of Christ. And this helps us understand what is the issue that plays out when people who might have different ethnicities, different cultures, different socioeconomic standing, if they use that as an opportunity to build a wall, what is the root cause of that? And we might say, well, maybe lack of education and we just need to educate people better. You know what Paul's saying? It's a sin problem. That there's a darkness that lurks in the heart of humanity that is just going to do that. And what is the solution? The blood of Christ. Talking about when Jesus, on purpose, allowed himself to be crucified so that the issue of sin could be dealt with. So that what separates us from God could be paid. What was the payment? The life of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The issue is a sin problem. You have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both, say this next word with me, one. Let's try that again. One. And has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. It's talking about what he did actually has this implication in the hostility barriers and walls that we can build up that Jesus came to tear those down. And we might go, well, that's a really neat metaphor there to tear down the walls of hostility. And, you know, it's just kind of this nebulous sort of principle. But I got to tell you, what he's talking about here is more literal. It's more literal. Let me tell you um, what I mean by that. He's diagnosing the problem that the walls of hostility are a result of the issues in the human heart and the solution is what Jesus did. That's our condition. And what he's talking about with the dividing walls of hostility is a literal thing. Here is a very simple illustration of the temple in Jerusalem. And there were literally walls everywhere. And the walls were to keep certain people out. So at the bottom of this image there in that tiny little uh, square at the bottom of that rectangle, that's the Holy of Holies. One high priest could go into that place one time a year. Just outside of that was the sanctuary. That's where all the other high priests could go. Just outside of that is where the other priests, the clergy, could go. Just outside of that is where the men could go, the Jewish men. Just outside of that was the court of women. That's where the Jewish women could go. And outside of that was the court of the Gentiles. And all the way around the walls of the temple, there was literally an inscription on there communicating the seriousness of the walls and respecting the boundaries. Here's an actual inscription. This is in a museum in Turkey. Foreigners must not enter inside the balustrade or in the forecourt around the sanctuary. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. Can you imagine what usher training was like at the temple in Jerusalem? (laughs) Hey, greet people, help them find their way, and kill violators, you know, just normal stuff. And so when he says, Jesus came to tear down the walls, what is he talking about? So when Jesus dies on a cross, you know what happened inside the temple? There was a huge veil from the ceiling all the way down to the floor thick, and it separated the Holy of Holies from all the rest of that building. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus died, that veil tore from top to bottom, signifying God going global and moving out from that place to everyone. And so when it says that he came to tear down the walls of hostility, It's not just a figurative phrase that is being used. For he himself is our peace. There's a lot of hostility. He is our peace. Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. When he died, he tore down those walls. There's a story about some GIs in World War II. They were in the country of France. And in a battle, they lost their buddy. He died. 
And they knew they needed to get back very quickly to their base for another battle that was coming the next day, but they didn't want to just leave their friend there. And they saw a church off in the distance and they went up there. There was a priest outside and they asked, can we bury our friend here? Um, you know, he, he loved God. And the priest asked, I have one question. Was your friend Catholic? And they said, well, no, he wasn't Catholic. He said, well, then you can't bury him inside of this cemetery. It's a Catholic cemetery. So they looked at each other and they decided, well, you know what? We got to do something. So they dug a grave just outside of the fence and covered him over and went and got ready for what was coming next. Early the next morning, just before they move out, they wanted to go pay their final respects. And they went back to that little church and then they're mystified because they're walking around the edge of the fence and they can't find the grave. We just dug a grave yesterday. The ground was disturbed. There's nothing here. And then they saw the priest working in the garden. They said, hey, we wound up burying our friend yesterday. And he said, yes, I know. And half the night, I wondered about that and what I said to you. And the other half of the night, I spent moving the fence. And your friend is now inside the fence. And there's a picture of what Jesus did that moved the fences that sometimes dark human hearts create to build walls rather than bridges. And he is our peace. And he tore down the walls of hostility, of those things that can be used to divide us from each other. So how did he do it? By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Now, what is that? That's talking about a lot of the laws that you find in the Old Testament. Sometimes they're referred to as kosher laws. And we might ask the question, you know, well, one, why did God do that? And why don't we do those anymore for the most part? I mean, they just aren't a part of what we, you know, do on a regular basis. Here's why we don't do them. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. Everything that it was meant to point to and to communicate has been fulfilled in Jesus. But why did God do that? That he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace. This is a really complicated um, phrase in the original language, but here's the meaning of it. That out of all the diversity of backgrounds, ethnicity, cultural, socioeconomic, God is seeking to create a new kind of humanity that is united in something and someone that is bigger than all of the other cues that we might use to create our sense of community. There's something and someone so much bigger. So then God, if you were doing that, why did you even give those kosher laws in the Old Testament? Well, he tells us, this is from the book of Deuteronomy. See, I've taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them. Why? For that will be your wisdom and understanding and your sight in the, peop in the sight of the peoples. Who, when they hear all these statues, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Here's what God is saying to them. That's Moses speaking to the people right before they go into the promised land. God gave us all of these kosher laws to give us a positive difference in this world. Because God's heart is for all the nations, for all the people who matters to God. Everybody does. And so God created a community with some beautiful distinctives that were meant to be a light to the people that mattered so much to God. That's why he did it. And we might ask the question, well, if that's why he did it then, and now they've been fulfilled in Jesus, do we have a positive distinctive, a positive difference? Hold that question. Because here's how we reverse the problem and might reconcile us both to God in one body. He's going to get on a roll, and I'm just going to make my way through this. Reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. 
Well, I thought Jesus died on the cross. No, he killed the hostility as well. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. We talked about that before, but now you are not. For you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I thought God's presence dwelled in the Holy of Holies. Not anymore. It dwells in the heart of people who put faith and trust in him. And part of what it means to be in Jesus is that this is the kind of community that he's seeking to create. One body, one spirit, one kingdom, one house. That there is a unity in diversity. We're not talking about being exactly the same. Folks, that's a cult, and that's not what's being talked about here. This is about being unified in something and someone bigger than all the other ways in which we might create the boundaries of identifying our community. And Jesus talked about this too. Here's some words shortly before he went to the cross. I do not ask for these only. He's talking about his disciples who had been with him for three years, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. It's for all the people who would trust Jesus after that time. If you put your trust in Jesus, guess what? He was praying for you and me on that day. Well, what does he want us to do? That they may all be, say it again with me, one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And do you see it again? There's the world. And there is the heartbeat of God for all people who matter so much to him. What is our positive difference in this world? And Jesus on that day says, yeah, you know what? I fulfilled those kosher laws. Here's the positive difference now. Unity. In something and someone bigger that transcends all the other identity markers that we may have in a culture like this, a polarized culture like this. And so picture this. Once, not once upon a time, because that's a fairy tale. Once, in a real place, in real lives, there was a different kind of community the world had never seen, where a Roman soldier would sit next to a Roman slave and they would view themselves as one. The culture never did, but they did. And men and women would see themselves as one. And people with different pigments of their skin would sit with each other and they would be one. And the world has never seen anything like it. And it was an incredibly powerful communication to a world that was divided in so many ways. But here's what often happens in this world is that we take the differences that we have and we use them to build walls. And we're not all the same. And so what we do is we construct Identities and boundaries and barriers. We build walls instead of bridges. Separated rather than divided. And so let's apply that maybe to our day. So imagine a Republican and a Democrat sitting with one another. And they're not going to vote the same way on election day. But whether it's in a context like this or maybe when they sit down in their small group, they're unified in something and someone bigger than them. And people of different ethnicities and cultures sit with one another and recognize the God-given value they have. And people who maybe come from a different part of town all recognize the value that they have. And I'm going to let Kenley come and help me to help you to be able to see this. Instead of building a wall, 
they are different in many ways, but they are one. And they have been unified around something and someone so much bigger than all the other ways in which we might identify our community. What kind of impact today would a community like that have? Where there is a lot of diversity, but above all that, there's a sense of unity. And it's a unity that transcends all of us. So let me ask you this question as we wind this down. Am I rebuilding any barriers that Jesus tore down? Because when he died, he killed the hostility. And he broke down the walls. And we've been called to create the kind of community that brings his light to people who matter so much to God. And Jesus says, I pray, God, that they would be one, just as you and I are one. Would you bow your heads together with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for recognizing the reality of life in this broken world of ours. Thank you even for exposing the realities of the human heart that many times are a lot darker than we would even like to acknowledge. And thank you for bringing an opportunity for there to be such a positive difference in this world of ours. So positively different than what we often experience. And God, at a time like this, would you help a community like this? And God, that is us. To be unified around who you are and what you are calling us to become. Thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for your power that is at work within us. God, thank you for what we are becoming in Christ. So we honor you and we celebrate you and we are so, so thankful for you. And we ask and pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media, at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram, and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.